Silence. You've been with us in this series? Anybody jumping in for the first time? Everybody here with us, been with us? You enjoying it? You like it? You, yeah, you like it? All right, I'll put an end to that. I'm kidding. Uh, no, uh, no more colonoscopy stories this week, but uh, um, I, I know you're looking forward to it. So, I don't <clears throat> But I do have a story for you from back in the prison days, back, back when I was in prison. Um, yeah, when I was a correction officer back in, in the prison, uh, there was a, a, another officer that was there, and... Uh, and he had, he had uh, been working a long time and, and, and struggled. He was at the end of his career, and he had, he had a few little uh, ticks that, that he had. And it was, he would l- literally, when he started to talk to you, he would start with that. And that was the stress of the job, and, 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 uh, and, and that did that. We really ignored it. We knew him, a great officer, great gentleman. Uh, everybody really ignored it and didn't really pay any attention to it. And... and uh, Anybody, uh, anybody heard of a Tourette syndrome? Yeah, yeah. We had an inmate who actually had, we actually had several inmates that, that had it at the prison that I was at, but the one in particular made a very unusual sound before he spoke. Every single time before he spoke, he would just do this sound. And then he'd say whatever he was going to say. It was really kind of unusual. But just like the officer, because it was part of our everyday routine, we didn't pay any attention to it. We ignored it. It just, we just went on with the day. Well, one day in a, uh, our, our, uh, something went wrong in our uh, electrical systems, and we had to have a, an electrician come in, and when an outside vendor comes in, he gets escorted by an officer, and, and of course, this officer that I'm talking about was his escort that day, and he walked in. This is an absolutely true story. This actually happened. The officer, the, the, the electrician walked in. He comes in with a little six-foot ladder because he knows he has to work in a ceiling panel that's, that's locked up, and so... He is up in his electrical panel doing his job, and the officer's standing there because it's a, it's a passway for the inmates to go by. And sure enough, the inmate with Tourette's comes walking by while the electrician's up on the ladder, and he looks up the ladder, and the, and the, the electrician looks down, and he goes, oh, 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 what are you doing? And, and, and he's just standing there frozen because he's never seen anything like this before in his life. And he turns to the officer and he says, what is the matter with that guy? And the guy goes, what are you talking about? The electrician gets off his ladder, walks over to the first officer he sees who is a friend of mine and that's who told me the story. And he says, you need to get me out of this place. And he escorted him out of the institution, never to return. The reason I tell you this story is because what a fearful place it is to be in a position of no hope. He was fearful because of the inmate, and when he turned toward the officer... For a rescue, it wasn't there in his mind. What a fearful place that is to walk through life when stress and struggle and turmoil come up and to really have no hope of being rescued. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for your word and how it does bring hope to us, how we can be encouraged through your word because it tells us, it shares with us the events that are going to take place. Your prophecies are true. Your word is a light, a beacon of hope. And that as we press into your word, we don't want to take knowledge out of it. We want to take hope and truth out of it, so that we can be that light for the world. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, if you've been joining us, uh, Pastor Mike, if you went on Wednesday night, Pastor Mike has went through the big, long, two-board 
timeline. It went from one end of the wall to the other end of the wall and 70 weeks of Daniel and all of the things going on and the beasts and the statues. and the, so, so now you're up to speed. That was the, that was the Reader's Digest version. Okay. Phew. And so I know there's lots of different camps on these things, and, and, and I just want to share where we are at Life Coast on the next event that we believe is going to happen in God's timeline. And what we believe that is, is the rapture of the church, the taking up of God's people. And I'm going to explain why we believe that. And then I'll also talk today a little bit about the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness. But Wednesday night, we're going to dig in deep. This is the overview of these things. And Wednesday night, we're going to go a little deeper into this. So if you want to come join us or join us online for that, come in and fill in the gaps. But I'm going to start off by reading a passage here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm going to read through the first two verses in the very beginning of, of verse 3. So now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by spirit or by spoken word or letter, seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way. Okay, I'm going to stop right there because I'm going to pick up on some of the things that I find in common that we have in our culture today that these first century Christians also have going on in their life. I picked up on these words, shaken in mind, alarmed, and deceived. How many of us, for various reasons, are feeling shaken in mind, alarmed, and deceived? I see three. Okay, the rest. We can go home. Uh, nobody else is shaken in mind. Nobody's alarmed. Nobody feels deceived. Now, the reason that these people are feeling that way, I don't want to take it out of context. They're feeling that way because they feel like the coming of the Lord, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ has already happened and they're still here. Okay, that's what they're feeling. They're saying, well, we're hearing from people and we're hearing from writings. That we got a letter. They said it was from you, Paul. And he goes, no, if you got a letter or a word or someone teaches that the day of the Lord's already come, don't be deceived by that. Okay? So they thought they missed the bus. They thought they got something wrong. And so they're, they're shaken in mind means unstable thinking. When you have it shaking in your mind, you are, you're, you're going here and there and you're believing everything and you're going this way and that way and you can't seem to get yourself focused on truth and peace. It really brings chaos into your life when you have a shaken mind. And we have a lot of people who go down this road for various reasons. It may not be because you think you missed the rapture, but the results are the same. They're alarmed. They're stressed out. How many feeling a little stress? I mean, Pastor Mike just prayed about that this morning. You got stuff breaking all over, double car breaking, and and uh, he's got uh, machines breaking at work and things like that. And there's this stress. Everybody has something going on that stresses them out, and that's this alarmed that he's talking about. You're alarmed. You're stressed out, and then you're deceived. And here's the biggest one. Because this one actually is the cause of the others, believing lies. When you believe lies and you keep heading down that train, that route, it brings up being shaken in mind and alarmed. It adds bad thinking and stress, chaos to your world. So how do we stop from being alarmed and shaken and deceived. Here at Life Coast, we walk with a lot of people, 
And we say a lot of the same things because it's how Christ walked with people. Ask good questions. Ask good questions. Say that to me. Ask good questions. So remember, if you're in a conversation with somebody and you have a point that you want to make, instead of making the point, turn it into a question. Because when you turn something into a question and ask something of somebody, you're less pointing a finger at them and telling them they're wrong. You're bringing them along to start to think differently because you've asked a question. Once they answer the question, they now have revealed truth to themselves. You can't push somebody into truth. You can lead them to it by asking good questions. You know, Jesus asked questions all the time. That's what he did. Because if he just told somebody something, they may reject it. But if he asks them a question and they get a revelation for the answer, they own it. That's how Jesus functions. So we're going to ask some good questions today. So the first question is kind of based around the message, what's going to happen next? And this is the place in Scripture, one of the main places in Scripture. There are others, and we're going to work through those on Wednesday night. But this is one of the main ones that really just says it fairly clearly. Some of the problem is translation into English is some of the problem for us, why we don't see it as plainly. So let's walk through that. I'm going to read uh, verses uh, 3 through 4. So this is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day, what is the question about that they asked at When's the day of the Lord coming? For that day will not come unless the rebellion comes. Some of your translations might say the apostasy. Some of your translations might say something a little different, but rebellion is the word in my translation, which is the English standard. When, unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Okay, this text, I'm going to unpack it for you a little bit here, because this word rebellion is incredibly key to why we believe here at Life Coast what we believe, and why many other people believe that. And I just want to tell you, there are lots of camps on these things. There's lots of people who believe in different ways. It doesn't mean we hate them. It means that we ask good questions. That's all it means. Because this is an in-house debate. This is a debate for believers. This is like in your family dinner table, if you have a dis discussion with somebody and you're on different pages, you have that conversation, but nobody's kicked out of the family for it. You're still part of the family. So we ask good questions in love and grace and so we walk through this together. So here's the key. The word rebellion in Greek is apostasia. That's the word in Greek, apostasia. We get our word, and that's why it's translated this way in a lot of different translations. We get our word apostasy from it. And apostasy basically is a departure of orthodoxy in English. Apostasy in Greek is only used in one other place in the entire New Testament as a noun, okay? It's used in Acts 21.21, 21, and that verse says, do I have that? Do you have that? Did I give you that one? I'll read it to you. Do you have Acts 21.21? 21? You don't have it. Well, I will get it for you. It says, I'll just keep talking. I'll tell another story about the prison or... While I was sitting in the waiting room at the colonoscopy doctor, <clears throat> really, it was, it was traumatic, so it's still, still there. So Acts 21.21 21 says, And they have been told about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles 
to forsake apostasia, to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or walk according to the customs. So what it's telling us there is that their, 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 teaching, their teaching has apostasia, has departed from Moses' teaching. Okay? Now, we don't translate a word just if it only has two places in Scripture and it's translated different ways in both places. you got to struggle to hang your hat on one of them. This is just linguistics 101. You just you don't put that there. But apostasia, the root of it, is used as a verb 15 times in the New Testament. 15 times. And every single one of those verbs, in one way or another, reads this way. 1 Timothy 4.1. You got that one? Somebody didn't give you the right script. First, it's all right. I got to do a Bible drill. I got no problem. 1 Timothy 4.1. Now, the Spirit expressly says that in later times, some will apostas... Apost- uh, I can't say it in Greek. I can say it in Greek, but apostasante, there you go, apostasante, they will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceiving spirits and teaching demons. So this word apostasia, 15 times in one form or another, is translated as departed, a verb, departed. And one other time as a noun, it's departed, departed from a teaching, left a teaching, turned away from a teaching. So, it, so there's no reason to believe that the word apostasia in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, is going to read any differently than departed. That's how it gets translated. So let me read it to you with that translation in mind. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the departure comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes the exalted him against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God. Now, I did a bunch of research. I'll talk a little bit more about this on Wednesday night. But why would they translate it rebellion as opposed to departure? Because departure really lines up with most of the other translation opportunities when it comes to apostasia or apostasante. Why would they do that? In the era and the time of this, the um, covenant theology was the prime theology by the translators. And so to put departed in there, though rebellion is not a terrible translation, it's just not as accurate when you take all the language into into, into, into uh, consideration. When they use that word, they put apostasy, rebellion, which fit their theology much better. And so that was done in the King James Bible translation, and it continued on. As other people translated, they kind of leaned on what the originals did in order not to change a doctrine drastically. Good hearts, bad translation, in my my estimation. I am not a... uh, linguist. I just read everything. So we, so we have this word departure. Now it changes the entire construct of that verse. And now when you actually go back to the context of the question being asked, because this is what's going on, Paul is answering a question that the church in Thessalonica have asked him. He's written 1 Thessalonians, that's a letter to them, and you can see that in 1 Thessalonians, he talks about um, we don't mourn like others mourn, right? The, the, the day of Christ will come, the trumpet call of God, the dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive and remain will meet in the air. He's written that letter to them, and they've received that letter, and now they're getting news that it already happened, what he just wrote to them about. So in 51 AD, he's writing this follow-up letter 
in very shortly after, probably months after he wrote 1 Thessalonians, to clarify what happened, and they're asking him a question, and he's answering the question, and you know he's answering a question because he says, now concerning, and now he's quoting from the letter that they wrote them. They wrote to him. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in our being gathered, that's the question they asked. And they also said, we've gotten letters and stuff. He says, let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the departure happens first. Okay? He says, don't worry about that. You're out of here before that all happens. You're out of here before the man of lawlessness comes on the scene. You're out of here before that occurs. You're not going to be left behind as long as you love Christ as your Lord and Savior. So he's telling them that in pretty clear English. That's their question. So the rebellion doesn't really make a lot of sense in translation when you understand the question that's being asked. It says, and then he goes on to say, I'm just going to go to verse 5. Do you, do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And you know what is restraining him now so that he may res- be revealed in his time. For the mystery of the lawless, the, law, the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. This is verse 7. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wickedness, deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who do not believe the Lord, do not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. All right, I'm going to unpack a lot of that because there's more questions to be asked. So what what will happen next? After the departure, the man of lawlessness is revealed. Okay? So a lot of people ask the question, are we going to know who the Antichrist is? Are we going to know who he is? Is he going to be, is he alive? Is he alive now? Well, it seems that the order of things is the departure, we use the word rapture, the departure happens first, the rapture happens first, and then the man of lawlessness is revealed. Okay? That doesn't mean he's not alive. That doesn't mean he's not influential. But what it means is he's not going to step into that role until after the departure occurs. So we may not know who he is while we're here. Someone may guess right, but uh, it's kind of irrelevant because as, we're, as we de- depart, that's when he will be revealed. Why? Will he be revealed? He comes by a lot of names, right? Man of sin, son of destruction, antichrist. There's an interesting word because we uh, we don't really see that word in Scripture a whole lot. Most translations, it only shows up three times in 1 John uh, chapters 2, uh, 18, and chapter 4 of 1 John verse 3. In a King James Bible, you're probably going to get two more translations of that word in second in second john i think as well but it only shows up those three times and it's really not talking about one of them it says there'll be the antichrist but many antichrists have already come but we just kind of lock on to that word in christendom and that's the guy the antichrist but it's really only referenced one time he's more referenced as the man of lawlessness man of sin the son of destruction the beast right? We hear that word, son of perdition, the king of Babylon, the destroyer. There's lots of names to describe this world leader who's going to come on the scene right after the rapture of the church. The important thing is, is that are we, are we living in the hope of what's coming? That's the important thing. So the question is, what's stopping him right now From coming on the scene and why is this being held back and so we just read through some of that I'm going to reread some of those sections for you 
<clears throat> it says, do you not remember when I was still with you, I told you these things, and you know what, res- what is restraining him now so that he may be revealed in his time. So something is restraining him. Something's stopping the Antichrist, the beast, the, the, the man of lawlessness, from revealing himself. Something's stopping it. And it says, only he, per, a person, only he who now restrains it, the Antichrist, will do so until he is taken out of the way, and then the lawless one will be revealed. So what's holding him back is the presence of the Holy Spirit here within the church. The Holy Spirit is holding back the revelation, the revealing of the Antichrist, okay? So this lines up perfectly with rebellion being translated as departure, apostasia being departure, because when the church is departed, when the church is taken away, and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that the church has, who else is taken away? The Holy Spirit's taken away. So when the Holy Spirit is taken up out of this world, there's no more indwelling of the Holy Spirit for believers because there are no believers left here. And then the one who is holding him back, the one who is restraining the lawlessness, will be removed. He's removed, and then the Antichrist can step into his role that Satan has appointed him to. Okay? So we look at this text, and it walks through some specific but some general of what is going to occur. As we keep reading through that, the coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan. I just said he's appointed by Satan. With all power and false signs and wonders, general overview of what he's going to do within the final week of Daniel, the seven years of tribulation that's in Revelation. Pastor Mike talked about some of that last Wednesday. We're going to talk about more of that in the weeks to come. So those seven years, but this is kind of a general overview. So he's going to the lawless one by activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false. Boy, does that seem harsh. What do you do with that? Well, let me tell you, if you were there Wednesday night, you understand that 69 weeks have been uh, uh, the prophecy of the 69 weeks of Daniel, that seven seven seven-year periods, so 490 years, have been fulfilled literally. Every prophecy has been fulfilled literally within the timeline that was given. Only that final seven-year period has not had a literal translation, okay? So if you look at it that way, the full 70 weeks is a God's final dealing with Israel, all right? It's his final dealing with the, with the with the nation of Israel. So that's what the tribulation is for. That's, it's the last final dealing of God bringing wrath upon Israel for their rebellion in the Old Testament. And that's important to understand because now when you read this text, therefore God sends them a strong delusion so that, may, that they may believe what is false. Now you have a place to put that. Because the they is not just anybody. The they he's talking about is the nation of Israel. So why does that happen? Why is, what is God waiting for? What's, what's happening? So Romans eleven twenty five. 25. You got that one? There it is. Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery. Brothers, a partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. Okay, so why is God doing that? For all of us Gentiles. 
My apologies to any Jews in the room. You're welcome. But God has put a partial hardening on the nation of Israel, which is part of his judgment on them. It's, it, it's part of the judgment from the, from the disobedience in the Old Testament. And so when we look at the two entities, the church and Israel, as separate dealings, God deals with them separately. The Bible recognizes them separately. There are some overlapping blessings that occur, but prophecies tend to be very distinct between the church and Israel. And we'll talk more about that again on Wednesday night, but just to give you the quick overview. So what is God waiting for? This is what God's waiting for. 2 Peter 3.9 says, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. What's he waiting for? He's waiting for us. He's waiting for the full number of the Gentiles to come in. He's waiting for the church to step up and be the light and reach the lost world. Do we know who they are out there that are lost? No, we don't. But God doesn't tell us to only reach those who are part of the full number. He says, let me worry about the who. You concern yourself with the obedience in the what. You want Jesus to come sooner? Let's get busy. These walls are here for us to come together, to encourage each other, to lift each other up, to look into the Word of God and get our marching orders. Our marching orders are to bring in the fullness of the Gentiles. And we're just not talking about get them to say a prayer, throw them into the dun basket, all right? Because Jesus' instructions were for us to make disciples. And that means walking with people. And I know some of you just went, but people are messy. Yeah, they are. People are messy. But he's called us to walk with them to help them get out of their mess and into a redeemed lifestyle. That one broken part of their life after another gets redeemed into a godly lifestyle. We stop doing the things that out of a broken heart and start doing things out of a redeemed heart. We walk with people through that. We need to take our mind off the deceptions that are going on and put it on the redemption that God's offering for everyone. That's where we need to be. God's patience is what's stopping the departure, the rapture from happening. His patience is what's holding it back. Once that occurs, it's all going to get pretty ugly, which we'll talk about more in weeks to come. But I want you to understand there's birth pains coming up to that moment, and we will be engaged in those things. You know, just like the poor electrician on the ladder, we're going to be looking for the the exit. We're going to be wondering where our help is. I wanted you to understand this portion of text so you know, you absolutely know that we'll be pulled out of this before the revealing of the Antichrist. There's hope in that and there's redemption in that story. We can walk with this any way we want to, our theology might be different. The hope is still the same. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. Our redemption is in Jesus Christ. Our being gathered to him is because of Jesus Christ. Our salvation is because of Jesus Christ. That's what we need to be sharing with our community, with the people in our circle, our sphere of influence, in our neighborhoods, at our workplace. Are we that light that says, I see what's going on all around, but I still have hope. I still have peace. I don't have a shaken mind. I'm not stressed out. And I know 
that my Savior is coming for me. That's what keeps me happy. That's what keeps me smiling. That's what keeps me humorous. All those things is what keep me going, is that Jesus Christ is coming back for me. And he's coming back for you. He's not going to leave you there. He's not going to leave us here in the turmoil, in the chaos. Yes, it might get started, but he says, I'm coming for my children, and I'm taking them home. Get into the world and share that hope, because all they're seeing right now is the chaos. All they're seeing is the hopelessness. All they're seeing is, I don't know how we're ever going to get out of this. Is our country ever going to be the same? It might not. But Jesus is coming back for his children. Jesus is coming back for his church. I'm going to get some rapture practice in. I'm going to go to the trampoline place. Get some, get some rapture practice in. Because I'm leaving. All right? I'm going. I'm out of here. And while I'm here, they're going to know that Jesus is what I'm about. Is they going to know that about you? Or are we walking all around and nobody knows who we are? And one day they're going to turn around and you're going to be gone. And you know when it says Jesus is going to wipe every tear? You can't wipe away what's not there. We're going to have many tears for all the conversations we didn't have. Let's eliminate some of those tears that Jesus is going to wipe away. Let's not miss a conversation. Let's not sidestep one. Let's not avoid it because it's tense. Let's step into the tension with good questions. Ask good questions. Learn how to ask good evangelism questions. Evangelism questions. Because when you're asking questions, questions are really put people off their defenses. Jesus is coming. Let's start asking Jesus questions to the people around us. And let's see if their hope doesn't find its way to the Jesus who's coming to take his family home. Stand with me. We're going to pray. Worship team's going to come. We're going to sing a song here, and I want you to, to kind of grab onto the words. I want you to really press into them. We got some events coming up, trunk or treat. If you want to get engaged in that, that's a place to have conversations with people, ask good questions. That's what these outreaches are for. They give us, the church, the opportunity to show people hope, and especially on a dark day like that. It's going to be a sign up over there to decorate a trunk or just be a volunteer for that day. I want you to really pray about can I take this opportunity with a whole bunch of my family members to engage with the community as they come in? And I believe last year, even though it was drive through we estimated we had over 600 people go through it. So there'll be more this year because they've been trapped in their houses. So there'll be more. You're going to have a chance to engage with people with the hope of Jesus Christ, the Savior who's coming to rescue his church, and they can be a part of that if they would just sh turn their heart over to Jesus, surrender to him, and walk in righteousness with a disciple partner that could be you. Father God, I thank you so much that we have a hope in you, that we can change our entire style of life, not because we've decided to do it, but because you're redeeming us in every area of our life. Clean hands, clean heart, the good God wants us to be walking with him. In that name we pray, Jesus, mighty, holy, precious Savior's name. Amen. Amen. Sing. Sweet word, are you here?